Shabbat Shalom, Internet. Are you all decent? You want to say hi? Hello. Say hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> oh, <sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're in uh, Muskogee on part three of phase one for the Muskogee mission, and it is Sabbath morning early. There's We're on uh, portion three of coffee. I had some Vicky coffee and some Tony coffee, and now we're having some Michelle and my coffee, and it's awesome. Um, what does that thing hold, like two gallons? I don't know, a lot of coffee. A lot of coffee, that's awesome. <laughs> two and a half pot. All the coffee. All the coffee, That's it's a bear-sized coffee pot. That thing's awesome. So, we are in Numbers chapter 12. I should add, because I'm gonna get all the questions. If you want to come on mission next time, go to bearindependent.com, click the missions tab, and there's a sign up form there. And um, Bella's looking at me like, whoa, the internet is talking. There is, there's a, there's a sign up form there, and it uh, we won't spam you. The only information we will send from that sign up form is, hey, we're going to go to this place on this date to do these things to help these people. That's it. So if you're interested in that, you can go check that out. Uh, you can also whip out your Bibles and flip to Numbers chapter 12. Um, in Hebrew, it's Bemidbar, which is Hebrew for numbers, because this chapter is full of numbers. And so we leave off in uh, chapter 11. Basically, a whole bunch of people were grumbling because they didn't have any meat to eat. And uh, so... <laughs> Moshe was kind of PO'd at the father, and he's like, why did you send me these people? I didn't ask for this. These people are just whiny. They're spoiled. Um, and, yeah, Moshe was uh, it, literally in 11.11, he's like, so Moshe said to Yahweh, why have you done evil to your servant? Why did you do this to me? Have I not found favor in your eyes? Right? Like, aren't we friends, bro? And you put the burden of all these people on me. Right, and so they were hungry, they wanted meat. So Yah is like, okay, watch this, I'll send some meat. So he sends quail, and the quail, they're, they're like, there's a stupid amount of quail. Like the least of them gathered 10 buckets of quail. The guy who got the fewest number of quail got 10 buckets full of quail. And they all lusted after meat, gorged themselves, and then they were consumed by the father for untrusting and so you can go back and watch numbers 11 uh last week if you want that but that's the context with which we find this and so numbers 11 revolves around moshe interceding uh to the father on behalf of the people okay which he does repeatedly which brings us to numbers 12 now Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moshe, Moses, because of the Cushite woman whom he had taken, for he had taken a Cushite woman. They were grumbling, right? They didn't like the fact that he had this wife. And there's a lot of opinion and conjecture on the internet as to who this wife was. Short story, it doesn't say who right here, okay? But because of this wife he had taken. And they said, has Yahweh spoken only through Moshe? Has he not also spoken through us? And Yah heard it. Now Aaron was the high priest, right? He had an ordination from the Most High. And Miriam was the prophetess. Also, interestingly, um, the root, that mim of Miriam, means water in Hebrew. And so if you go through and read this word, where not all the places, but most of the places the Hebrews find water in here is where you see Miriam appearing in the Old Testament, which is interesting. But anyway, she was the prophetess, right? And so they're now jealous of Moshe. They're like, who does this guy think he is, basically? It's numbers three. And the man Moshe was very humble, more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. And suddenly Yahweh said to Moshe and Aaron and Miriam, all three of them, he says, you three come out to the tent of appointment. And so the three came out. And Yahweh came down in the column of cloud and stood in the door of the tent of appointment and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both went forward. So he's like, look, kids, meet me at the tent. They meet him at the tent. He comes down. Dad's pissed. Okay. 
and he said, Hear now my words. If your prophet is of Yahweh, I make myself known to him in a vision, and I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moshe. He is trustworthy in all my house. I speak with him mouth to mouth and plainly and not in riddles. And he sees the form of Yahweh. So why were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moshe? So what he's saying is like, oh yeah, you clearly understand that if I give my prophets, you know, me, if I deliver myself unto my prophets, they'll speak to you, right? But Moshe, I give him my words plainly, no riddles, like, he's my guy. You know this. You've seen this. How dare you speak against him? How dare you, right? And he's like, how could you not get it? This guy's dwelt within your midst is basically what he's saying. Um, okay, and the displeasure of Yah burned against them, and he left. Yah left. And the cloud turned away from above the tent, and look, Miriam was leprous, white as snow. And Aaron turned towards Miriam, and look, a leper. And Aaron said to Moshe, O oh my master, please do not hold against us the sin in which we have done foolishly, in which we have sinned. So Yah comes down and delivers leprosy on Miriam. That's interesting. There's actually a compare contrast here. There's a push pull. In Exodus 34, 29, for all y'all playing along in the home game, I'll go back there. Better sheet. No, that's Genesis. Exodus is Shemot. 34, 29. We can read, after Moshe spends 40 days up on the mountain, face to face with the Most High, he's coming, he receives the Torah, we get instruction about uh, the feasts and so forth and so on, then he comes down off the mountain, 3429, and it came to be when Moshe came down from Mount Sinai, while the two tablets of the witness were in Moshe's hand, when he came down from the mountain, that Moshe did not know that the skin of his face shone since he had spoken to him. And Aaron and all the children of Israel looked at Moshe and saw the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. He'd been in the presence of the Father for so long, he was so filled up that literally his face shone. Compare that against Miriam, leper. She's now got leprosy. Her face is like snow. It's turned white. It's fallen apart like... There's a clear compare contrast here between being favored by the Father versus not being favored by the Father. And everybody saw it. That's the other thing as well. It's undeniable for both of them. When Moshe had it, all the children of Israel saw it. They were actually afraid of him. Like, what's going on with that guy? Like, that's a little intense. Uh, versus Miriam, clearly, I mean, she was given leprosy by the Most High. That should be a pretty clear indication of like, yeah, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> so, <clears throat> okay. And Aaron said to Moshe, O oh my master, please do not hold against us the sin in which we have done foolishly and in which we have sinned. Please do not let her be as one dead when coming out of his mother's womb with all his flesh half consumed. And Moshe cried out to Yahweh saying, O oh El, O oh God, please heal her, please. So again, we've got Moses interceding. Again, he's like, please, Father. Like He literally, uh, and we're going to get there in numbers, we're just a couple chapters away, from the Father smoking a whole bunch of Hebrews. And Moshe's like, he goes, how am I supposed to get these people to worship you when all you do is kill them? <laughs> it's just like, and the Father goes, well, if they do my things, I wouldn't have to smoke them all the time. Okay. And that's a clear parallel. Hey, man, if you just do my things, I won't have to smoke you all the time. Right? And so, yet again, we have Moshe interceding here. So, please, oh God, please heal her, please. And Yahweh said to Moshe, if her father had but spit in her face, would she not be ashamed seven days? That's, you know, ritual cleanliness. It's like if somebody spit on you, you'd be, you'd be ashamed seven days, right? So, and again, we were talking yesterday about the parallel of the father, right? And how that terminology is so fitting. Let her be shut out of the camp seven days, and after that, let her be readmitted. And Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days, and the people did not set out until Miriam was readmitted. 
And afterward, the people departed from Hatseroth, and they camped in the wilderness of Paran. So she was shut out of the camp seven days. We can read in Leviticus, if somebody has leprosy, you shut them out seven days. You observe them. If after seven days they're good, you bring them back in. And there's a whole protocol. It's like, uh, no, nope, they still got leprosy. Cool. Leave them out there another seven days. <laughs> it's a seven-day period. So she was basically ashamed seven days for questioning that Moshe had an ordination from the Most High. And so there's some interesting parallels there. Um, I think it's John 7, 5. Yeah, John 7, 5. So I'll go there real quick. Mark, Luke. Luke, Acts. Where'd you go, John? So... John 7, 5. Something smells wonderful. I think it's a combination of the coffee and the bug spray. <laughs> I, <believe you're> right. <laughs> I think that's what it is. All right, so um, John 7, 5. Let's just start at 7. After this, Yeshua was walking in Galilee, for he did not wish to walk in Judah, because the Jews, the Yehudim, were seeking to kill him. Makes sense. It's like if you're a blood, you don't go walking through Crips territory, because they're going to kill you, all right? And, and the festival of the Yehudim was near the festival of Sukkot. And his brothers said to him, Get away from here and go into Judah, so that your taught ones also see the works that you are doing. For no one acts in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these works, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. This is Yeshua. His own brothers were like, whatever, dude. Oh, yeah, if you're something, why don't you go to the Festival of the Jews? Go to Sukkot and pr just prove it. Just prove it, bro. Yeshua's own brothers didn't believe him. And so that's an interesting parallel between Numbers 13. Aaron and Miriam were Moshe's blood relatives. They'd seen him. They were afraid of him at times. They still didn't want to believe what he had going on. And I think there's actually something there in that his own siblings didn't believe him that gives him an even higher level of credibility with the people that he's leading right there's no nepotism there it's not like oh well those those moshes of mitzrayim they're all but like no they were they didn't his own brother and sister took issue with him at times i think that actually leads to leads it lends even more to his credibility that his own family wouldn't get on board with them because then you know that it's not just something of man. You know what I mean? Does, yep. does what I'm saying make sense? Okay. It's coming from a higher source. Exactly. It's coming from a higher source. Like this coffee. Beep, beep. I'm, I'm deeply offended. I think somebody was just setting an alarm to let you know. That Is that, that was the coffee alarm. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> okay so then we come to numbers 13 uh which is well they're gonna send a crew and they're gonna go do some recon okay and yahweh spoke to moshe saying send men to spy out the land of canaan which i am giving to the children of israel send one man from each tribe of their fathers every one a leader among them and then now uh, we're going to get into some names. There's a couple of people on here that just like me speaking Hebrew is nails on the chalkboard to them. So I apologize to you out there. I'll do my best. And by the mouth of Yahweh, Moshe sent them from the wilderness of Paran, all of them men who were heads of the children of Israel. And these were their names from the tribe of Reuben, Shamua, son of Zachor, from the tribe of Shimon, <laughs> Shaphat, son of Hori, from the tribe of Yehuda, Caleb, son of Yephune, I be Yep, Hana, Yep, honey. That's literally what his name is. Yep, honey. Okay. Hey, you gonna do that? Yep, honey. Sure am. From the tribe of Issachar, Yigal, son of Yosef, from the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, son of Nun, which is Joshua or Yehoshua, which interestingly enough means salvation, which is the same name as Yeshua, Messiah, which means literally salvation. 
but we don't have to read this Old Testament. There's nothing useful in here. There's, it's just, that's for the Jews, man. They don't, we don't read that. That's their book. We read the, the new part and then nobody talk to each other. Don't compare notes, right? And geez, anyway, from the tribe of Benjamin, Benjamin, Palti, the son of Rahu, Rahu. Uh, from the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, the son of Sodi, from the tribe of Yosef, the tribe, from the tribe of Yosef, from the tribe of Manasseh, Gadi, son of Susi, from the tribe of Dan, Amliel, son of Gemali, from the tribe of Asher, Shetur, son of Michael, Mikael, from the tribe of Naphtali, Nabi, son of Wapshi, Wapshi, from the tribe of Gad, Geuel, son of Maki, these are the names of the men whom Moshe sent to spy out the land, and Moshe called Hoshea, son of Nun, Yehoshua. So that's what Moshe called him, Yehoshua, Joshua. And Moshe sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up here into the south and go up to the mountains and see what the land is like and the people who dwell in it, whether strong or weak, whether few or many, and whether the land they dwell in is good or evil, whether the city they inhabits are whether the cities they inhabit are camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are forests or not. And you shall be strong and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season for the first fruit of grapes. So he's like, look, here's the 12 guys. You guys go and do a recon. Here's some things I want to know. How big are the cities? You know, how are there trees? Are there not trees? Where's the water? at? This, this is like recon 101. Go and observe and report back, and here's the things that I want to know. So he tasks them with that. And now was the time of the season of the first fruit of grapes. So they went up and they spied out the land from the wilderness of Sin as far as Rehob near the entrance of Hamath. And they went up through the south and came to Hebron and Ahimon and Sheshe and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, were there. Anak, is, that is a word that jacks people up because of, what is the name of that book? Enoch? No. Enoch, maybe. The book of Enoch, but there's another guy. Uh, Chariots of the Gods. That guy. And the Anunnaki. Because we're going to look at something here at uh, 1333 in a hot minute. But yeah, that word there. Do a little research on Anak. It's interesting you will find rabbit holes and worm trails and have a have a day or two to lose on this okay um okay the sons of anak were there now hebron had been built seven years before soan in mitzrayim so this is an old place hebron okay it's been built seven years before mitzrayim egypt right and I came to Wadi, to the Wadi Eshkal, and cut down from there a branch with one cluster of grapes. One cluster of grapes. And they bore it between the two of them on a pole. So this cluster of grapes, you ever see like those, yeah, massive thing, right? Like, you know, like the natives have like a boar on a pole and they're hiking through the jungle. Imagine like a cluster of grapes like that. Like massive. Which I could not have right now because of the Nazarite vow no grapeies but three days three days right now when let's see today's the seventh so when you all see this it'll be the 14th because that's how life works on the internet three days september 10th anyway um so massive grapes right and uh where did we go Oh, and they also had pomegranates and figs, which is cool. That place was called the Wadi Eshkol because of the cluster which the men of Israel cut down from there. And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. A recurring theme, 40 days, 40 days, 40 days. Moshe was on the mountain 40 days. Yeshua was in the wilderness 40 days. These guys were spying for 40 days. Noah, 40 days, like 40 days, 40 days, 40 days. Um, so after 40 days, they returned from spying and they went and came to Moshe and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh, which means set apart. 
and they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. They're like, hey man, this is what's going on. Check out these grapes. And they reported to him and said, we went to the land where you sent us and truly it flows with milk and honey and this is its fruit. But the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are walled very great. And we saw the descendants of Anak there too. There's that guy again, Anak. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, while the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Aborites, Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. And Caleb silenced the people before Moshe and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are certainly able to overcome it. So Caleb's like, Look, everybody simmer down. Let's go. Man of action, this guy. And they gave the children of Israel an evil report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land eating up its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. And we saw there the Nephilim, the Nephilim, sons of Anak, and the Nephilim. Literally, that's what it says. And we saw there the Nephilim, sons of Anak, and the Nephilim. And we were like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and so we were in their eyes. We were tiny compared to these guys. Okay. So, there's a lot contextually going on in this part. The first is, and we'll get to 14, you know, Numbers 14. Uh, they could have gone into the promised land right there. Caleb was like, let's go, man, you know. Speed, surprise, violence of action, it gets a lot done. Giants or no. I'm like, oh, cool, they're giant. Let's take our axes. We'll smash them in the shins first. Then when they fall over, we'll beat them in the brains. Like, that's kind of where my brain goes. It's like, cool, develop a strategy, you know? If we can only reach to their kneecaps, cool. Hit them in the kneecaps. Catapult their faces, whatever. We'll figure it out. Ankle biters. Ankle biters, it's <laughs> exactly like, yeah, if we... <laughs> If we have to be chihuahuas, we will be chihuahuas, right? And so, but instead of going in and just taking their inheritance, Canaan, the land that was promised to them, we'll see in 14 that they choose otherwise. But the report, an evil report was given, right? And there's these sons of Anak are there, man. And we saw there the Nephilim, sons of Anak and the Nephilim. And we were like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And so we were in their eyes. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of flipping, and I'm going to do it pretty quickly because I don't want to bore everybody who's here, and uh, we have things to do today. But if we go back to Genesis 6-4, so you all playing along at home, go to Genesis 6-4. Okay, T. Um, Genesis 6-4, we'll just start at 6 for context. And it came to be when men began to increase on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of Elohim saw the daughters of men that they were good and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And Yahweh said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever in his going astray. He is flesh and his days shall be 120 years. And we recently talked about that. Who was I talking about that with? Somebody. Clearly not you, because you look bewildered. Okay. Um, the Nephilim, Nephilim, were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. That little and also afterward is... Just hold on to that. So the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. Okay. And also afterward, when the sons of Elohim came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, the men of name or the men of renown. Okay, and so there's a lot of people who say that these traditions that we have of like um, these Greek lowercase g gods, right, and these Roman gods and all that, that these were them, that they had all these super abilities and all of that. Uh, the men of renown, the men of name, okay? That these were somehow the offshoot of what many people consider to be angelic beings and human females. Now, 
the interesting thing is, and I don't have the Hebrew in front of me here, but, and I, again, I'm going to try to stay out of the weeds as much as I can. But it says the sons of Elohim. Now on any day, I'd count myself among that. Elohim, right? Father God, right? Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Elochenu, Yahweh Echad. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our father, Yahweh is one, right? Okay, so Elohim is just the plural of God, right? So it's talking about the plurality into the one. Okay, the sons of Elohim. Am I not that? Are you not that? Are you not that? Are you not right? Okay, but that phraseology has been interpreted and used for angels, where elsewhere we get messenger of Yahweh, which is malach, which means messenger of Yahweh, which is translated in the King Jimmy as angels. So were these angels or were these sons of Elohim? I don't know. Who was a knock? Okay. Was he a dude or was he an angel? But here's the thing. The Nephilim were in the earth on those days and also afterward. Because here in Genesis 6, we see that the father tells Noah, listen, all flesh has been corrupted here on earth. And so I'm just laying waste to this place. And so who was maintained, sustained after that? Noah and seven other people. Noah and his wife, his three sons, their three wives. That's it, because all flesh had been corrupted. Okay. Including the Nephilim, which were on the earth in those days and also afterward. And so here's where things get kind of weedy-ish. And again, just pick a week on your calendar, block it out, start Monday morning about 7 a.m., and somewhere around Friday at midnight, you might have an answer that you feel comfortable with on this subject. Okay. And so here we see, and also afterward in Numbers 13, 33, and we saw there the Nephilim, sons of Anak of the Nephilim. And we were like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And so we were in their eyes. Who the heck's Anak? Where did he come from? Some people say that there were two groups of angels that fell. And that the first group of angels that fell were in Genesis 6, 4, and that the offspring of those angels, which were referred to as the Watchers in the book of Enoch, which is an extra canonical text because it discusses a whole bunch of things that are not elsewhere found in the canonized Bible. The Watchers, their offspring were the Nephilim or the Nephilim, which were the giants and the men's of renown. So based upon that interpretation, if we go to Numbers 13.33, if we get Nephilim from fallen angels and if the Father had destroyed all corrupted flesh in Genesis, there must have been a second falling at some point that resulted in a further, you know, perpetuation of the Nephilim, the Nephilim. I can't, I don't know of a place in this Bible where it says, and then the angels fell a second time and then they, you know hooked up with the daughters of men and we got some you know angel baby nephilim giant things i don't and i'm not saying that that verse doesn't exist i don't know where it is okay um and if it does exist please tell me so that's one interpretation and the other is the sons of seth the sethites uh which was another child of adam and eve or adam and haba and um that Seth perpetuated this line of corrupted flesh and that this guy, Anak, is a son of Seth and that this corrupted flesh somehow perpetuated through the ages to here where we see in Numbers 13 that we still have this corrupted flesh on the earth. How that happened, I don't know, because in Genesis 6-4, all corrupted flesh was destroyed per the word. Which is why we're not going to spend too much more time on that, because per the word, all corrupted flesh was destroyed. So, and I hope I'm not boring y'all. Am I boring y'all? Okay. And so these are more, more questions and, and thought pieces for y'all to think about out there, because there's not a definitive answer in this word about the Nephilim, which means that... Uh, you know, maybe we don't need to know those things. Other than we're told elsewhere in end times, we'll be likened unto the days of Noah, where all flesh was corrupted, 
and there will be Nephilim. So hit him in the shins first and then smack him in the forehead with your axe if that's what it takes. And if that doesn't work, 50 BMG to central nervous system, I think we'll do the job. And if it doesn't, we'll figure it out. That's kind of my plan. You know, as Pastor Joe says, if, uh, if David could have killed Goliath with a rock, I think I can kill a giant with a Glock. And I'm like, I agree. <laughs> so, um, bless you, Pastor. I don't know if you watch these or not, but uh, sorry if I stole your thunder. So if we go, there's a couple of places we need to go to just kind of ish tie a little bit of a bow on this concept of the Nephilim, the Nephilim. The first is Jude 6 and 7. Now, I don't expect anybody to know where Jude is in your Bible because every time I go looking for it, I got to go to the, what do they call that thing? Where they there you go. Good job, Tony. Somebody get that man a cup of coffee. You're winning. Mm -hmm. Say it again. Right before Revelation. Thank I you. Say, I think it's in the yep. New Testament. Yeah, and it's yeah. it's a page long. <laughs> yeah. That's why it's so easy. yeah, right before Revelation. Thank you. You don't need to whisper. Next time, just yell it. Like, hey, dummy. No, you're not dumb. Okay, Jude <laughs> six and seven. So, Jude 1, because that's all we got. So, Jude 1, uh, 6, and Jude 1, 7. And the messengers, who did, remember messengers? Messengers of Yahweh, Malach, angels. And the messengers, who did not keep their own principality, but left their own dwelling, he has kept an ever the father has kept an everlasting shackles under darkness for the judgment of a great day even as Sodom and Gomorrah Saddam and Amorah in my bible and the cities around them in similar way to these having given themselves over to whoring and gone after strange flesh are set forth as an example undergoing judge undergoing judicial punishment of everlasting fire in the same way, indeed, these dreamers defile the flesh and reject authority and speak evil of esteemed ones. So there's a clear reference here to angels, right, who did not stay where they should have, their own principality, but left their dwelling, right? They're being kept in everlasting shackles under darkness. And then there's a reference to Sodom and Gomorrah, which were destroyed for why? Sexual immorality. Remember there were two angels that showed up at Sodom and they're like, oh, hey, let's have an angel party. And they're like, Lot's like, no, you can have my own daughter instead, but we're not having an angel party. And they're like, yeah, that sounds good. Let's have an angel party. Okay. So, so there's a reference here in Jude to that. And so that could be a reference to these Nephilim, the Nephilim and the watchers, the angels, which again... Y'all go wherever you want to go with this. I, this is what I found in my Bible, read this concept. And because like I said, all the rabbit trails, all the wormholes, all the things, there's, you can, but I would, you know, I would be completely honest and say, listen, you need to pray over these things before you let a whole bunch of nonsense come into your head because there's a ton of nonsense on this that is completely extra biblical, completely extra biblical. So, you know, the word is truth first and foremost, and so that's why we're going to stick to the word and then everything else after that. If it can inform the word and give us a better understanding, great. If not, you're just polluting the word and you're giving space in your brain and your heart to something that probably shouldn't be there in the first place. So, because, yeah, there's ancient alien theory and, uh, and just all, all the blah, blah, blahs. Um, okay. The other thing is 2 Peter 2.4. Second Peter two four. Where's that at? After the John. Um, that's before First Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. I'm clapping at the quick book, by the way. Yeah. Very good. Come on, fingies. That's the Thessalonians and the Hebrews. Man, my fingers are not working this morning. 
More coffee is indicated. There we go. Page 1188 if you're in the scriptures. <laughs> if you're like, hey, 1188. That's 1111. Interesting. 1188. Come on, fingies. If I see if I was one of those high speed guys, I would have stuck a bookmark right there. <laughs> but I'm not. I believe Pastor Joe says hold the corners over. Yeah. I didn't. And now we're all suffering for it. I did not fold the corners over. I'm not suffering. <laughs> Are you sure? Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, Second Peter two four. We'll start at two just for context. But there also came to be false prophets among the people. And I'll tell you what, this particular verse as well, consider the church that you go to and the leadership and authority you find yourself under in context of this verse. Okay? 2-4. But there also came to be false prophets among the people, as also among you there shall be false teachers who shall secretly bring in destructive heresies, and deny the master, Yeshua, who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Uh-huh. And many shall follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And in greed, with fabricated words, they shall use you for gain. From of old, their judgment does not linger, and their destruction does not slumber. Yeah. Yeah, whose authority do you find yourself under? Some some slick back hair, nice suit wearing pastor, you know, Sunday morning, or the most high? Because I'm like, I want a stovepipe, uh, you know, command structure straight to the most high. Um, four, for if Elohim did not spare the messengers who sinned, but sent them to Tartarus, uh, from the Hebrew, Tati, and sent them to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be kept for judgment, and did not spare the world of old, but preserved Noah, a proclaimer of righteousness, and seven others, bringing in the flood on the world of the wicked, and having reduced to ashes the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, condemned them to destruction, having made them an example to those at, who afterward would have lived wickedly, and rescued Righteous Lot, who was oppressed with indecent behavior of lawlessness, for day after day that righteous man dwelling among them tortured his righteousness by be righteous being by seeing and hearing their lawless works. Then Yahweh knows how to rescue the reverent ones from trial and to keep the unrighteous unto the day of judgment to be punished. And most all those walking after the flesh in filthy lust and despising authority, bold, headstrong, speaking evil of esteemed ones, whereas messengers who are greater in strength and power do not bring a slanderous accusation against them before the master. So, A, whose authority do you find yourself under in a church? Is that pastor a, you know, false and wicked leader or are you following messiah are you following yeshua that's an honest question that one should ask themselves i've never had a pastor that i didn't love with brotherly love um but i have learned over the years and i love my pastor right now he's a phenomenal human being but it's yah's word first and i am directly responsible for my relationship with the most high first now pastors and leaders of men will stand in higher judgment which is why james says hey my brothers let not many amongst you be teachers right uh because if we instruct people poorly not saying i'm a pastor but if we instruct people poorly we suffer for that we will stand in judgment for that but Y'all's relationship with your creator is your business first and foremost before it'll ever be my business. And if it is my business, it'll be 1% of my business where it should be 100% of your business, right? <clears throat> so who are you allowing to have authority over your life and where are they at? But then also we have another reference here to sexual immorality and fallen angels in 2 Peter. So... Getting back to Numbers 13.33, 
Who are the Nephilim? <laughs> Block out a week or two on your calendar <laughs> and start researching. But I don't know, long and short, I don't know how we get Nephilim in the land in Numbers 13.33 if they were all destroyed in Genesis 6. I don't know. However, it's there. So um, I would encourage you to do your own research. And I seriously feel like the more we read this word and the more we seek the Father's face, the better clarification we're going to get on things like that. So, cool? Cool. Shalom, y'all.